I'm being a bar right here, hello. Hi, can I just test? Can you hear me properly? Uh, so hello, welcome to ACAM's first ever online open meeting. We are delighted to welcome so many of you from so many corners of the world. And obviously with no geographical constraints, we're, we're all at home here. We thought we would try something a bit different and have our first ever international meeting. So this is the first time we're trying this, so please bear with us if there are any technical issues. We'll try and make it as smooth as possible. My name is Joe, as you can probably see, I hope you can see, and uh, I'm going to be attempting to facilitate this thing. We are eager to uh, get going, but I'm just going to run through a couple of house rules first. Um, so your microphones will be kept muted. Um, please put questions for the speakers into the chat box and we'll pick them out to ask a bit later on. Um, just go to the bottom of the screen and click chat and it should pop up on the right hand side. Uh, if you're asking a question, please also let us know your name and where you are. We want to try and pick out questions from all around the world. Uh, your video is automatically turned off. Turn it on if you like, but it may reduce the strain on all of our connections. Let's so just keep it off. We'll be using breakout rooms a little bit later, um, a Zoom function. Hold on to your seats and be prepared to have a chat with a few strangers uh, as we try and <laughs> recreate the feeling of a real life meeting. Uh, when we go into breakout rooms, please turn your video on. It's probably just a bit friendlier. So I am now gonna pass over to Annalisa, who is gonna reflect on the situation that we find ourselves in and uh, give a brief introduction to ACAM. So. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I hope so. So as Joe said, hi, I'm Annalise. I'm just gonna reflect a bit on why we are all here. So as ACAM, we are here to address the climate and biodiversity crisis. But we find ourselves here quite literally behind a screen because of the COVID-19 pandemic that has taken a fast and global impact. There is evidence to suggest correlation between the cause of both of these crises. In their effect, both are non-discriminatory. That's to say that no one is immune. But some populations will be far more vulnerable to their devastation. Both problems require a collective and proactive response. And this state of business, not as usual, has shown just how adaptive we can be in the face of a collective threat. If there is any hope to be found in this disconcerting time, it has shown that a new normal is possible. And let's hope it will galvanize a shift to address the climate crisis with the same level of urgency. This month, ACAN is celebrating its first birthday on the 20th of April. So it all began in Waterloo, or on Waterloo Bridge, at the Extinction Rebellion last spring, where the need was felt for a group to take urgent action on how the construction industry is contributing to the climate crisis. From early discussions down the pub, here we are, a year later, connecting several hundred people, a network of individuals running campaigns and working to facilitate systemic industry change. We've come a long way in a past year, and you can see some of the milestone events um, on the slide here. More information about these can be found on our website. So for the benefit of those that are new in the audience, we are working towards three overarching aims. These are decarbonize now, ecological regeneration, and cultural transformation. To achieve these aims, we operate under the set of values shown on the slides. If Joe wouldn't mind just passing over the slides for me. So yeah, these are the, um, the values that we operate under. And we are in the progress of finalizing an ACAN handbook. So this will contain, in addition to the manifesto, the values to be rep uh, respected as ACAN expands to new and international chapters. The way we are structured is as a series of working groups who meet autonomously to research and develop campaign ideas within their specific lines of interest. When a campaign is ripe, 
resources and recruit, recruited from across the ACAM membership to help bring the campaign to fruition. This might involve graphic design or outreach, and that is to say that all kinds of skills are useful. Anyone is welcome to join the working groups and participation is fairly fluid, becoming more consistent in the campaign lead up. Each working group has a coordinator who meet weekly to communicate progress and organize open meetings such as this one. And I have to say it's made much easier to organize an event of this size when we don't have to find a physical venue. Open meetings occur monthly and we've held several different formats of meeting, events and assemblies. So if you want to get involved going forwards, please announce, but well, we will announce all of the going ons on this broadcast and um, we'll put a copy of this into the chat. So that's all for me. Back to Joe. Uh, thanks, Annalisa, for that. If you want to know more, you can sign up to our mailing list on our website, www.architectscan.org, or follow us on Twitter or Instagram at architectscan. So I'll just run through the schedule for the rest of the evening, uh, and then we'll move over to our speakers. So we've got a couple of announcements um, from ACAM working groups uh, coming up first, and then we're going to do a brief two-minute check-in. Uh, which is something that we usually do at our physical meetings. So we're going to yeah, use the randomly allocated breakout room function. It should be a bit of a laugh. And then we're going to hear from our first two guest speakers following that, Scott McCauley and Sophie Pelsmakers. We'll have another breakout session for small five discussion groups and then followed by two more presentations, one from Theon Stevenson, and a joint presentation by Indriani Leongo and Honorine Vandenbroek from C40 Cities. Finally, we'll come back together for a short Q&A at the end uh, and a discussion with our speakers before wrapping up at 8.30. So to begin, I will pass over to Seb Lomas from ACAN to talk about an urgent campaign that we just launched this week. Uh, if you have any questions about this campaign, please use the chat box where a couple of people from the campaign group will be ready to answer questions uh, throughout the rest of the session. So I'm going to pass over to Seb now. Hi, Joe. Thank you very much for that introduction. So I am just going to share my screen. I hope everyone can see that. Um, as Joe said, I'm one of the coordinators for the Embodied Carbon Group and specifically at the moment um, have the honour of presenting ACAN's current and latest campaign, um, which is titled Save Safe Structural Timber. So, for those who aren't aware, currently the Ministry for Housing, Community and Local Government is asking for responses and views on a consultation they are holding on the current ban of combustible materials in and on the external walls of certain types of buildings. Now, I have to stress, we need you to act really quickly on this because the deadline is this coming Monday, the end of the day. And the reason why we need you all to get involved with this campaign is that if it's not amended and it passes as currently stands, structural timber won't be differentiated between cladding. At the moment, cladding and primary structure are all seen as the same thing. And it's imperative that distinction is seen. Otherwise, structural timber will be prohibited in certain types of buildings, further more than already existing. Now, this is the second consultation on this matter. The first was last year and an overwhelming number of architects responded, only two people. Good news is already we've um, passed that. We've got 10 architect, uh, professionals who have already responded, but we'd like to get the number way, way up. And that's why we are presenting this to you today. So um, we've been working with the Timber Trade Federation extensively in forming this campaign. And we back their three primary um, messages. The first, as I have already talked about, is the essential need for distinction between cladding on external walls and primary structure in, in external walls. And this is a message that's already been communicated by REBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, to the Ministry last year. 
and it's um, also something that the Scottish building regulations have already adopted, which is the third point from the Timber Trade Federation. Now, the second point is about making sure that risk-based fire engineered strategies are also um, part of the balance alongside compliance-based solutions um, using um, regulations such as, and standards such as BS 8414. Now, I need to stress that ACAN do unreservedly support stronger measures regarding the safety of our buildings. Alongside that, we also understand that it's perfectly possible when correctly designed, tested and constructed for timber structural buildings to not pose any greater threat to the occupants of the buildings. And they are also an essential way for us to decarbonize the construction industry. We've curated a whole load of graphics to help spread this message. This one's obviously highlighting the distinction between cladding on an external wall and primary structure. In this instance, CLT, that's in the external wall. This is one of Wolf Thistleton's projects. Now, the reason why that it's possible to safely design these structures is um, a number of reasons, um, and one of which is the predictable nature in which timber performs in a fire, um, which this graphic is demonstrating with regards to charring. Now, I do need to stress this is one of the ways in which, and it's important that when we make our responses, we are seen to be acknowledging the complexity of the matter. Alongside the three points raised by the Trimber uh, Trim Timber Trade Federation, we've got two further very important points. The first is that regulations need to be encouraging the use of timber rather than making it harder for the use of timber in the construction industry. This is a point that's already been communicated by the Committee on Climate Change to the Ministry of Housing. Um, because they acknowledge that it's a key way in which we need to decarbonize our construction industry quickly and also simultaneously delivering the number of houses that we need quickly. And the final point is the fact that we need the government to recognize the significant contribution that the architectural and design industry has already made in researching and uh, pioneering fire safe timber architecture. And that's something that's under threat by the span. So this graphic is demonstrating something that most of us are very well aware of, the fact that timber structures can offer much lower embodied energy solutions for buildings. This is a statistic uh, from a report commissioned by the Cl Committee on Climate Change. And simultaneously, when we're talking about policies, whilst the UK is trying to increase the restriction on timber structural architecture, France is mandating that all Olympic buildings under eight stories must be 100% structural timber. So how can you help us and how can you help the industry and the country? Um, so similar to the Part L consultation for the future home standard that you might have seen, we've created a very informative website. Um, the URL is on this uh, page and it's also in a lot of our media on our website. And the most important thing that we can ask you to do is take time out of your weekend, your Easter holiday weekend, and view our response, view our bullet lines that we've helped, we've created to help you make a full personalized response. This is the most important way we can communicate our message to government. The second thing we would ask you to do after then is use our template MP letter in order to write to your local MP so that they have the right information to ask the right questions to the government. And thirdly, use our graphics to share this message because we urgently need to get this disseminated as quickly as possible. These are just uh, captions of these three pieces, the MP letter, the full ACAN campaign response, and then our bullet point version, which will help you write your own personalized response. So we've created this presentation that I've just run through in five minutes, um, and we are going to send this presentation round to you all tomorrow. We hope that having seen this, you will feel not only empowered enough to respond to this consultation, but also potentially use this presentation that we're going to share with you and present this to other people, other professionals, other architects, your peers, your friends, in order to empower them to feel comfortable enough to respond to this consultation, because it is only with a very loud voice that we will be able to get the ministry to hear what we need to say and for them to make the necessary changes. Thank you very much.
Seb, uh, and a reminder, if you have any further questions, a couple of people from the campaign will be uh, in the chat box ready to respond. Uh, so now I'm just going to pass over to Poppy Beck, who has two hats on. She's got an ACAN hat and uh, Architecture Education Declares hat as well. She's going to be talking about how the two groups have been responding to COVID-19. So I'll just pass over to you now, Poppy. Great, thanks very much, Joe. Um, yeah, so I'm Poppy Beck. Um, I would like to give you a brief update on a campaign that we've started to design, fabricate, and distribute uh, PPE equipment and ventilator parts to frontline NHS workers and to hospitals around the UK. Um, at the moment, we're quite London-centric, so we've been supplying 10 hospitals um, and have successfully delivered a variety of different masks and equipment to NHS workers who are on the front line protecting us. Um, they've given us back some very good feedback um, and we've been able to uh, create an iterative design process which has involved an incredible team of volunteers and helpers uh, all the way through from design fabrication to logistics and supply. And at the moment we would really benefit from anybody's help anybody who would like to contribute to this uh, is more than welcome to get in touch we'll be posting links after uh, this update and um, we've, we've partnered with uh, the global group helpful engineering so helpful engineering is a global effort to open source designs and there is a team of around 4,000 scientists engineers doctors and architects all working to try to create solutions to the problem at the moment and produce a variety of designs and again work in an iterative process and then distribute them to hospitals around the world um, and at the moment in the UK we are also uh, we have a really good team at the moment some fantastic people working on it but we'd be really uh, happy to have people contribute their effort whether it be through uh, logistics or making um, especially if you have 3d printers available and you're able to uh, print out some of the masks we can deliver you the STL files for you to get started and uh, even people, if you would like to contribute, uh, cycling around and de delivering masks or any other parts by bike, that would be great, or car. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it for the moment. Thank you, Joe. Great, thanks, Poppy. Uh, great stuff. And I'm sure I speak for everybody here when I say that's really inspirational. So uh, it's almost time for our first speaker. But first, we're going to just pass the microphone over to you guys. Uh, we're going to have a three minute check in and you'll be randomly placed into breakout rooms uh, to say hello to each other. After three minutes, you'll automatically be returned to the main room. So don't worry about that. Um, make sure everyone gets a chance to chip in and maybe tell each other where you are. What's the one thing you're enjoying about lockdown life and the one thing you're missing? Um, so have fun, uh, press the button, Sam. <laughs> okay, we, sh we should be all back in here now, I think. Um, well, so welcome back. Uh, bet that was a bit chaotic, hopefully fun too. Um, so if you're all sitting comfortably, we're going to move on to our first speaker. And a reminder that for this session, uh, pop your question, your name, and where you are in the chat, and we'll pick up some of these questions to ask later on. So we are delighted to welcome as our first speaker, uh, Scott McCauley. Uh, Scott, based in Glasgow, is amongst many other things, the coordinator of the fantastic Anthropocene Architecture School delivering public climate literacy workshops and holding crisis design studios in Glasgow and further afield. We've been really inspired from afar as Scott has created a hive of activity up in Scotland, giving countless number of talks and workshops. He also sits on the Glasgow Institutes of Architects Sustainability Committee, the RIAS Sustainability and Climate Change Working Group, and is a long-term contributor to XR in Glasgow and Scotland. So with pleasure, I will now pass over to Scott. So yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Scott McCauley. I'm based up in Glasgow in Scotland. 
Uh, I use he and him pronouns and my background is pretty much in architecture, climate justice activism and I kicked off the Anna in Architecture School. So if you don't know what it is, and I'll just kind of run for everything, the Anna in Architecture School is a decentralised alternative school of architecture, activism and climate literacy. And I kind of kicked it off uh, just after October of 2018 when the special report on 1.5 degrees came out and there was a bit of a non-response in architecture. And I just kind of thought personally that we've got a moral responsibility to respond. My education wasn't responding, so I just kind of started. And it was initially supposed to be a one-off protest, just one event at the Scotland Architecture Fringe, where you've got to submit a provocation if you want to take part. So the provocation of the Anthropocene Architecture School was that in the context of climate breakdown, architectural education as delivered is obsolete. And I kind of assumed that people were going to respond very kind of aggressively and do things and jump into action, but nothing really happened. And people started to ask kind of, okay, you're right, what do we do from here? So kind of from there, I had quite a few workshops with practices, with the public, and realized it wasn't so much that there was a willful ignorance. It was more just a gap in education. So from there, I started to kind of jump into the workshop side. But before kind of saying that education was entirely obsolete, I did a little bit of research. So I surveyed lots of architecture students in Scotland to just kind of quantify what students did and didn't know about sustainability. So this got kind of broken down into concepts of self-assessment. And by the end of it, the kind of the average score for your architecture student coming out of kind of graduating was 59% understanding of sustainability, which is kind of terrible because you wouldn't let a pilot fly a plane if they were 59% sure, you wouldn't let a doctor do surgery if they were 59% sure. But still, we had people graduating who weren't totally sure about what sustainability was in the built environment. And if that's your graduates, it means people who've been in the profession for a great term, time longer are going to have an even bigger gap from not having that kind of modern touch. So kind of from there, I sent an open letter to every school of architecture in the UK asking them to do as Culture Declare started, to declare there to be a climate and ecological emergency and to collaborate with each other and to do something about it. So the grand response of totals from them was two and there was no response. So I thought, seeing as you can't really wait for schools of architecture to get their shit together, so I was to start doing things myself. So from there, I moved into delivering workshops, the first of which was a kind of a hackathon of Extinction Rebellion. So we linked up activists, architects, NGOs, local councillors, put them in a room, focused on specific aspects of the city and let them kind of run wild and can use brainstorm a solution. So these gave lots of good responses, had great conversations, but nothing in particular kind of jumped into happening. So from there, I moved into doing kind of climate literacy for practicing architects. And then the feedback that kept on coming back was, I don't know where to look for this. Where do you find all of it? The kind of sad truth of the matter is lots of this was my slightly dark Twitter feed, which is quite graphically terrifying. And then this kind of took this one hour workshop and expanded that to be three hours with an extra hour that kind of is like kind of breathing space because dealing with the climate crisis is quite an emotional subject and you always want to give people that kind of breathing room to raise a hand and say I want five minutes to like let myself calm down. So kind of why literacy is because in the same way as we have fluency in maths and, and kind of writing we don't have the same environmental literacies that people would have had traditionally. So this is when you tell people that they don't understand something in architecture, you get a kickback. You get people quite aggressive. They will stick their heels in and say, I know everything. I'm a chartered part free. But if you approach it as literacy and you're just filling in that gap, it's kind of more about your understanding the context of climate breakdown and climate emergency, your understanding the immediacy of it. It's affecting different parts of the planet proportionally different. And it's about intergenerational injustice. There's whole generations whose future is effectively being stolen from them. But if you're going to talk about where the built environment is going to be responding, you've got to do that in a way that's not aggressive or blunt. You have to do it in a way that's quite mindful. But it's also acknowledging the history that we've known about climate change for over 50 years. 
we are not the first people responding to it and we should be kind of respecting and acknowledging the other people who came before us doing quite a lot of great work. So the last kind of part of what Infraobstion Architecture School does is the crisis studio. So these are, it's incredibly simple, it's pretty much just you find a space, you get a tutor team of people with an expertise in sustainability and then you give this to students. So students can go directly to people who can use their projects as an armature to teach them about sustainability that they're not getting in their School of Architecture. So this was, uh, right, da, da, da. so pretty much it's also a kind of a peer review. So every single crisis studio has a feedback mechanism. So we get feedback from the students for what they want to learn, why they're there. And from the tutors, we get a bit more of an insight from are there any recurring themes of what people don't know or what we should be approaching next. So using that kind of mechanism, we judge the average understanding of architecture students in 2020 is about 32%. So if that's the kind of gap we're looking at, there's a matter of urgency in dealing with things straight away as well. But at the same time, in Scotland, I'm incredibly lucky because I'm blessed with a network of people who are incredibly passionate and really want to get stuck in and want to take part. So the Crisis Studio so far has involved 30 different organisations, groups and individuals. And it's been in two cities in Scotland. And in total, the Enterprise and Architecture School has engaged directly with about a thousand people in less than 12 months as well. So kind of for the Beyond Borders part, I was asked to talk about COP26 and what we're doing in Scotland. But at the moment, COP's been postponed. So I'll kind of go through a few kind of ideals if we want to kind of take what we're doing beyond borders and in quite a kind of productive way. So the kind of first point I want to make is that we should be learning from how youth climate movements have been organising and mobilised because they've set an incredible example of using really simple means, not focusing on capital cities, not basing it too heavily on complex mechanisms, but they just really get shit done. And if we want to do the same thing as they've done and mobilise architects in a big way, we need all hands on deck. It's not just a one city does it all. It's very much making it as accessible as possible to bring in but pretty much we need everybody, so why not jump in that way? And next of all, it's the next stage is also going to be admitting we don't know everything. So as architects, we have it sort of drilled into us to never admit that we don't know something. But if you have a particular kind of specialty regarding sustainable design or that sort of thing, you really should be, if we've got a climate emergency, it's getting to the point of you should be sharing that. We should be kind of doing that as much as possible. Instead of consultancy, it should be a school. We should be diversifying this. So we need lots of people doing lots of things well and not just one or two practices that are specialised. And then kind of as a closing point, if we're going to affect this internationally, we need to share all of the softwares and tools we're developing for this. So there's no point in thousands of practices, thousands of people thinking God knows how many hours into embodied carbon calculators if one person's done it. We don't have a carbon budget or time. So as of the 1st of January 2018, we had 420 gigatons of carbon for a 67% chance to stay below 1.5 degrees. And we use roughly 52 gigatons per year. So we don't have time to kind of focus on intellectual property rights. It's kind of time we put the kind of collective good before capitalism and profit. So that's kind of all we really need to say. And that's me done. So cheers. Great, thanks Scott. Uh, really great to hear everything that is going on north of the border. Very, very impressive. Um, remember to throw your questions into the chat box uh, with uh, your name and, and where you're from. Uh, and we'll use them at the end. We've got about 15 minutes at the end for questions. So we're gonna be pulling those questions out uh, and giving them to our speakers. Uh, so we will move on to our next speaker now, which is, um, Dr. Sophie Pelsmakers, uh, who we are delighted to welcome to this meeting. Sophie is an environmental architect, educator and researcher with expertise in energy demand reduction and holistic sustainable architecture and housing design. Based at Tampere University, Finland, where she is chair in sustainable housing design, she authored the Environmental Design Pocketbook, which I'm sure you all have a copy of in your offices or at home. It's a comprehensive little book which com combines environmental science, legislation and guidance in one source. And she's currently co-authoring two publications to further increase knowledge and respond to the climate emergency, both due in 2021. So uh, without further ado, I will pass over to Sophie now.
Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that you can see my screen now. Um, I've not done this before, um, apart from testing it yesterday. Um, but and can you hear me okay as well? I hope. Otherwise, somebody shout out. Um, but I'm zooming in from 61 North in Finland. Most of our lakes are still semi-covered with ice. Um, and I was asked to give a brief overview about sustainable architecture in the Nordic region and obviously uh, here in Finland as well. Now, I've only got 10 minutes and I've only been here for eight months and about um, two years in the Nordic region. So this is a snap snapshot in time and doing my best um, to uh, be as complete as possible at the same time, what might be in of interest to you. Um, I'm not going to say much more about myself after the presentation, um, but I've been teaching. So I'm one of those people who's been already for 20 years in um, this field, um, trying to educate uh, loads of future architects as well. I've also been in practice. Um, next year will be an edition three of my book coming out and I'm working with Judith and Hattie. I think Hattie is also on this call, Hattie Hartman, uh, on energy people buildings, architects for changing world. Um, and they also said there is two other publications as well, which actually uh, one of them is a climate emergency curriculum working with people in Denmark and also at Sheffield University. Um, and it's very much related to um, Scott's talk just now responding to that call uh, for a new um, kind of curriculum in architecture. And with uh, Nick at Studio Bark, we're also working on a Reba Journal issue on a climate emergency, all of that coming out next year. So I'm briefly going to run through um, some headlines, then particular challenges in the Nordics. Um, of course, I'm zooming in on very specific aspects that I think are quite current. Uh, then what we can learn from the Nordic region and where there's room for improvement. And then I'll finish up with some local initiatives and organizations in Finland. And I really want to then um, see if anybody's interested, if we can kick off an ACAN North or an ACAN in Finland as well. So um, as Scott also uh, introduced, there's been headline after headline uh, increasing. Of course, now we hear a lot more about coronavirus, but um, it's very much related, of course, given that humanity and nature are not separate and we must see them as one to fix also the climate crisis. Um, you know, we've heard about how climate change is melting, drying and flooding Earth and Finland is no different uh, in that. So they're looking at wet winters, uh, a warming Baltic Sea and also the fells that normally don't have trees will become more forested, while also other areas will actually lose more trees because of um, global warming. And so Finland announced about six months ago that they want to be climate neutral by 2035. Of course, how will it get there is going to be very challenging. That's only 15 years time. And interestingly, um, they're actually the most ambitious at the moment in the EU. Sweden is by 2040, Denmark by 2050, like the rest of the EU. Norway is not in the EU, but uh, has said that they will aim for 2030. And uh, as I just said, this is going to be an extreme challenge, especially because um, to give you one example, is Helsinki as a city have just established an energy challenge um, and you can go to the top link energychallenge.hel.fi if you want to take part. Um, the deadline is I think in August or in September. But the reason why they've established this challenge is that about half of the city's heat is produced with coal still. And actually in certain areas of the city near the, um, the district heating uh, centers, you can actually see the, the coal uh, mountain. Um, there's also other challenges uh, aside from uh, energy and the fossil fuel used for heating energy in Finland. There is an extremely large population of elderly people um, and expected to increase. You can see that here on the map, so the darker color, as you can see in the Mediterranean, people are expected to get well over 83 years old, but also Norway uh, and Finland and Sweden uh, are also very much part of that. There's also another uh, big issue and um, usually not openly discussed necessarily, and that's of internal migration. So the red colors on this Europe map uh, shows you where there's densification in areas and in cities and towns expected. The blue is where there's a degrowth in certain regions. And you can see in the Nordic region, especially the north, um, you know, above the Arctic Circle, but generally the north um, and in Finland and Sweden, especially, there's a lot of blue and areas that are actually losing population. And then, of course, densification elsewhere. And then um, Lauren Smith, um, the, new, the uh, north, the world in 2050, 
uh, actually sets out uh, a really interesting argument that there's also going to be a lot of external migration expected by 2050 in the Nordic region, particularly from the Mediterranean regions and other areas that will just become um, too hot, too inhospitable um, to live. So do check that publication out as well. And that really brings me then to a changing climate. Um, so Finland, along with the Arctic region, has already warmed uh, by two degrees C Celsius in the past 150 years. It's about twice as fast as the rest of the world. Um, and in summer, they expect that the more severe heat waves will kill three times as many elderly and ill people in Finland. And of course, you know, there's also going to be more uh, older population on top of that as well. And we've already noticed, uh, this was actually my first winter proper in, uh, in Finland. And a lot of people would ask us, how are you coping with the cold? And actually it's not been that cold at all. I think minus 13 was the coldest this winter in Tampere, um, but it's been dark. And the reason why it's so dark is that if there's less snow, um, there is less reflection of light and the whole environment is experienced very differently. And so they're also expecting mental health problems that will rise uh, because of these periods of darkness that will just extend. Also, because if there's less uh, snow and ice, um, people uh, have, uh, can't go and ski, for example, and undertake other kind of traditional leisure pursuits in winter. Uh, but also um, the way that uh, in winter people can move around the city very different. Distances are actually quite long, but when the lakes are frozen, people can actually use the lakes to actually uh, move around on. And of course, that will be uh, less frequent and less long as well. And then, of course, uh, we're also really facing uh, in the Nordic region uh, territorial loss from uh, sea level rises. Um, this is uh, basically the south of Finland, Helsinki and Turku. And we can see this uh, by the end of the century at the bottom, if it's four degree rise, uh, what that might look like. But actually, Denmark is uh, much more um, in a much more precarious situation with regards to territorial uh, loss. And they're actually quite proactive on looking at solutions and um, building in different ways uh, as well. So what can we learn from the Nordic region and where is the room for improvement? Well, um, first of all, um, low energy buildings are a given here. Um, because uh, you will die uh, without well-insulated buildings. So they're basically given. And it means that energy issues are often not really talked about anymore. Um, and that actually is, I think, in itself a little bit of a danger um, because, because we don't then discuss where heating energy comes from, like the Helsinki example, um, and uh, how we might achieve that. Um, and so there's also at the moment concerns about the summertime overheating in a warming climate, but the industry is actually quite slow to catch on and realize this. This is a picture when I was in Stockholm in uh, uh, early October with uh, throughout the city, loads of retrofitted reflective blinds to um, you know, basically keep their buildings cooler. Um, yet we still new buildings are being built as if uh, it's only for this um, kind of cold climate. Uh, and other issues also that architects think that what they design is actually what is built. So there is little uh, post-occupancy evaluation and building performance evaluation by most architects or in industry. I know that this, uh, this is um, a page out of the Architects Council of Europe summary from 2018. And I know that these numbers are a bit questionable because these suggest that in the UK, 90% of architects uh, who responded to the survey said that they had undertook some level of post-occupancy evaluation and the average in the EU is 13%. But Finland is, for example, only 7% and 6% in Denmark. So if we're thinking that these numbers look a little bit high, you can imagine the reality is also probably a lot lower. And, um, and this is something that isn't at the moment really registering yet, particularly with architects, although I think it will change because of changes that will come in in the industry and through legislation as well. The second thing that uh, the Nordic region are pretty good at is timber construction. We also heard earlier on about um, the, the call uh, for um, you know, uh, embodied carbon and to support that. So it's obviously local resource really supports the local uh, economy. Um, of course, CO2 you know, sequestration, but there's also a tension between how much they harvest of the forest, which actually counts towards carbon offsetting versus whether it's actually in a building material. It's quite a common for a house construction, one to two stories, less so for apartment blocks, but again, that is also changing. 
And um, one thing, because there's so much natural environment in the Nordic region, particularly in Finland, what I've noticed, and I don't mean to offend any Finnish people that are on this call, um, but I think most of them might have heard my opinion about this. I'm always surprised that um, there's so little care taken about the existing greenery um, and rock, uh, for example, as well, and that people just uh, dynamite rock to clear the land and get rid of trees. One example, as you can see here, is that to create sustainable transport and you tram from the city center to the suburb, um, suburbs, um, they just literally knocked all the trees down in the center and none of them are left. So they will replace with smaller ones again, but of course it takes a long time uh, for this to grow uh, in a colder climate. Another downside I would say about the perhaps the focus on timber construction is that there's not been that many um, it's sort of as a given again, and so they really focus on CLT as prefabrication. You can see an award-winning, uh, quite wonderful housing scheme on the left by Opia. Um, but there's actually very little discussion about the implications of building in this different material and what that means for uh, spatial design. So uh, on the right, the, the two images on the right, you can see this is by Van Kunsten in Denmark, that they were working with uh, uh, non-load bearing CLT and post and beam as designed for disassembly, but also that actually it's much more um, um, easy to, to adapt spaces over time and to move walls again. In Denmark, they're also at the moment doing some really interesting um, experiments with materials, particularly reclamation and reuse, um, where they can't uh, rescue the bricks one by one, they're actually diamond um, sewing them and then creating them as new cladding as well. So it's all quite experimental, uh, what architects are doing there. So definitely uh, people to watch there. And then I did want to say something about the welfare state. Um, it actually really affects the language of how we have discussions. And I just wanted to give one example about fuel and energy poverty, which is um, something that we're uh, very aware of uh, in the United Kingdom, also throughout other uh, European countries. Um, but because there's very little evidence of fuel poverty being an issue in winter in the Nordic region, it's not completely zero, but it's um, less, or what's registered is less, it's around about 1%, less than 2% of the population. Um, but there is going to be, of course, an increasing concern about summer overheating and cooling uh, energy poverty if we're not careful. But in a welfare state, when you talk about energy poverty, um, that term isn't really understood very well because um, the approach is always that you try to prevent poverty of any kind in a welfare state. So we sort of need to frame issues differently to have a common language uh, as well. So they will understand building over heat and cooling energy, not necessarily energy poverty as well. And then finally, I think where there's particularly room for improvement is that I've noticed that there's often a lack of a holistic uh, approach and uh, there's a lot of focus on energy resources and economy so they you know they end up with um, very good and very high standards but it is often as i was showing you earlier at uh, expense of biodiversity sometimes daylighting and adaptability as well including also adaptability to changing climate and of course we need consistently high values in all individual factors um, and we know that is now um, very much the case so I just, uh, if there is time still, I just briefly wanted to run through some local initiatives uh, and organizations. Uh, Demos in Helsinki is very much a spin-off of Demos in uh, the UK, uh, in London, um, and they're uh, pretty active. There's also a sustainable change research network called SUCH, um, and some other projects are listed here at the bottom um, where they support uh, household energy savings and for transition to climate neutral electricity system. And actually, the such uh, network has got quite a lot of uh, members from Leeds uh, University. Um, Helsinki also have an energy and climate atlas. This is a screen grab of that. Um, it's both 2D and 3D, and you can click on it, and it shows you real and calculated energy data related um, to sort of the city blocks. And then I wanted to finish up with uh, Untitled, which is coordinated by Demos. And this year was going to be the first of a 10-year process. Um, where they really want to bring art, activism, um, and experimentation together all about climate. Um, this was supposed to be held, and I think it will still be held, but will now be online probably uh, on the 11th and 12th of June in Helsinki. There's loads of different partners, some from the UK included, so do check them out. You can see that here on the right, um, also from Denmark and so on. And they have, I think, a quite interesting model, perhaps quite similar to ACAM as well, about bringing committed people together 
brainstorm in a festival, have conversations, and then coming out with real experiments and uh, alliances to then create a narrative and really uh, transform society. So um, that brings me really to um, my ambition, um, hopefully with some people who are uh, on this call, um, to kick off uh, an ACAN in the Nordic region. Perhaps we start in Finland. Uh, I've been in communication with ACAN. Uh, London has been very helpful. Um, it's a little bit delayed because of the lockdown. I'd like to start in earnest next month, but it's really about joining forces with others in our region so that together we can make a difference. So anyone who's interested, uh, who's in the region, um, please get in touch uh, via my email or Twitter. And that's it from me. And I somehow now have to stop sharing the screen. Yes, okay, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I think I managed that okay, I hope. That's it, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was uh, really interesting and um, great to see some examples of similar things uh, and very much looking forward to ACAN Nordic. Uh, I think you're probably the furthest north of anyone on this call, but um, if anyone is further north than 61 degrees, please do let us know in the chat. Uh, so we're going to have around five minutes of discussion now before the next speakers, uh, again using the breakout rooms. Um, remember to unmute yourself when you're in the breakout room. You can do that on the, on the bar at the bottom. Um, and uh, we're keen for people to discuss what they've heard, but also talk more broadly about the theme, which is how can we collaborate nationally and internationally to create a movement for real change in the way our built environment is made? Uh, and for a bit of context, we've been acutely aware over the past few months um, that ACAN is so far a London-centric organisation. While we've been working on campaigns which are specific to the way architecture is practised here, we're actually all operating within much wider national and international regulatory systems and within a global financial system uh, and of course climate change affects the entire planet so um, how can we all help each other uh, and ensure that we learn from the differences we face at a local level to create systemic change on that broader level okay we're, we're gonna um, tip you into randomly allocated breakout rooms again and you may wish to just discuss what's happening where you are what needs to change and perhaps how you can keep in touch uh, with each other in the future So welcome back. I hope you had a good chat in there. Please do put those questions and ideas that you might have just come up with into the chat box and we'll come back to them a bit later. Uh, for now, we're going to go straight on to our next speaker, who is Fionn Stevenson. Fionn, who is calling in from Sheffield, holds a chair in sustainable design at the University of Sheffield. Uh, research develops innovative methods of building performance evaluation to improve design, policy and practice in the built environment. She examines the interfaces between housing and people from a holistic perspective that includes resource use in its widest dimension. And the, the first ever lecture I had about sustainability in the first year at Oxford Brooks was given by Fionn. So she's probably part of the reason I'm now involved in ACAN. We are excited to hear about what role the UK educational network can play. So, I will pass over to Fionn now. Hi, Fionn. Hey, um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I hope people can see that. Yeah, we can see that. Great. That's good. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for having me. I'll try and keep to my 10 minutes. Um, yeah, as, as was said by Joe, I'm, I'm just going to really focus unashamedly on education for the next 10 minutes. Uh, so first of all, what's the architectural challenge in the UK? Um, we've got the ARB and the RIBA responsible for validating us as, as professionals. Um, for quite a long time, when a number of us were pressurising the RIBA to change its criteria to make them better, we were told by the RIBA that the EU Bologna Agreement prevented us from actually making things more specific. Uh, so that's been a big hold up for the, a number of years, but of course things have changed now with Brexit. Um, one of the very, very few benefits of Brexit, if there are any, is that we're not tied to the EU-Bologna agreement anymore. 
and that opens the door of opportunity to actually really re-examine our education criteria in the UK. Howard Liddell from Gaia Architects, who was a, a mentor of mine, uh, once said that architects should have a duty of care built into their um, profession, which should be one of doing no harm. And that means no harm, not just to people, but also no harm to the environment. And, and that would make us like doctors. And one, one could say that in a sense at the moment as architects, we're actually carrying out open heart surgery on the planet just now, uh, in terms of the impact that we're having. Now, doctors in their training have to use criterion referenced uh, validation criteria, which is they have to demonstrate their skills and they have to demonstrate those evidentially, and they have to demonstrate their knowledge. Now, in architectural education, that is not required. You don't actually have to demonstrate these skills. What you have to do is to show you have an understanding. And I'm going to try and un unpick this a bit more as a, a kind of thesis running through this argument about why we need change. So we go into the studio, um, some of you have seen the slide before. We, we go into the studio and we create the dream design. Um, and you know, this is often what we do in practice as well. But actually, when we look for the evidence base for that dream design, we can pull it right the way back to education. And here we have the RIBA validation criteria still in force from 2014. And the two key criteria that students have to satisfy is GC2 says they have to be able to understand environmental strategies and the regulatory requirements. Nothing there about demonstrating any competency or skill to deliver those, just to have an understanding. GC5, another general criteria. Students will have an understanding of the needs and aspirations of building users, an understanding of the impact of buildings on the environment and an understanding of the precepts of sustainable design. But again, no need to demonstrate with evidence what that actual impact of their buildings are. So my point to the ROB is just how woolly can these criteria actually be? The good news is I hope all of you have read the RIBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, the download on their website fantastic guide put together by Gary Clark and others. And this really throws the gauntlet down to the educational sector uh, and says, okay, here are some real targets. Here are some real criteria to meet evidential targets. So obviously one would expect that the RIBA validation criteria would now meet this, meet these uh, targets. Now, at the moment, there is a review going on on themes and values of education led by David Gloucester and others and with Gary Clark there as well. Um, but I would really like to know that the RIVA are going to insist that students need to learn how to assess the performance of their buildings in reality through studio work by understanding how to do with POE and it can be done. It can be done and it just needs the political will from the institutions. Other good news is we've already got great guides out there like this one from Letty that actually builds in energy performance into the whole design process. And again, you know, this could be taken straight into the schools, but it's not. So one of the reasons I wrote this book um, that some of you will have seen is because I'm a passionate educator. Um, I've been educating architecture students since 1990, I think. So about 30 years now. And there's a chapter in this book that actually explains how we need to educate the designers, but probably even more importantly, educate the educators, capacity to build education. There are very simple exercises that we can do within studio practice, either in the office or in schools of architecture, that just take people out to existing buildings and do a quick evaluation. There are simple tools. Every school of architecture should have one of these. All students should be taught how to use them. Every single architecture office should have one of these, even if it's just something you fix onto your iPhone. And most schools of architecture have got these, but a lot of these are just rotting in cupboards and not doing very much. And actually they're very useful. They're not particularly precise, but they do give students a real indication of some facts and figures that lie behind a lot of the design fantasies that go through the studios. 
So one thing I wanted to draw people's attention to in the same way that Sophie has so brilliantly drawn attention to what's happening in Finland is what's happening in the USA. This is a brilliant resource, the Society of Building Science Educators. Some of you will be familiar with it. If you're not, please go and have a look at their resources. Join them. We don't have the equivalent of this in the UK yet. I wish we did. Um, we have something called the Association of Architectural Educators, AAE, which is a, a great resource. But we don't have something like this that's really focused on des delivering um, for the, the climate emergency. And this group is a fantastic lobbying group, people in all over schools of architecture in, in, in the US. Um, and last year they had a symposium dedicated to how, how can we teach carbon neutral, carbon zero carbon design in our schools. And this then led by this organization presenting a declaration to the equivalent of the RIPA in, in um, the USA, which is the American Institute of Architects and also to their validation board to say, come on, let's get real about architectural education. So I'd, I'd really encourage people to, to check out um, the SBSE and they've got amazing teaching resources on there as well. That's just a quick screen grab of, of, of what's there. Um, they also have a, a mailing list you can join. They produce newsletters. They have um, retreats in the summer um lots of really good things so we need something like this in the uk as well now in terms of international cooperation um many of you will remember perhaps those of you who teach in architecture the wonderful series of conferences that happened over a couple of decades led by sue rofe and others called teaching in architecture um, and these conferences nurtured sustainable design through evidence-based research being done by teachers um, they've stopped. They don't happen anymore. We have CLEAR, but we don't really have the equivalent of a teaching and architecture conference do, so that needs to come back. And the Association of Archi Architectural Educators in this country really needs to dedicate a whole conference to the climate emergency. Another great initiative that was started off in the US and that's now spread around the world is the Solar Decathlon, where students not only design but they also build and then crucially they test and monitor their own designs and this really is something that we should have an ambition for in the UK. So at Sheffield we have a very big live projects program online and we've had programs where we've collaborated online with with other countries around the world, South Africa, Madagascar, South America, um, great projects and you know you can share student work between the countries online. You can even visit the same sites online. Um, what I would say is I think these, these projects need to be more focused on the climate emergency, but how, how do we as, as a group of educators mainstream live projects like this? We've also got a climate emergency committee at Sheffield that's student-led, kicked off from the MArch, um, and the idea there was to draw on their skills and then take it down through the school. Um, I did a podcast interview with them yesterday. Um, they're organising a materials library, organising meetings, very much alive and kicking, and very much hoping with folk like Scott McCauley and others to kick up with other, uh, to connect with other schools across the country. So that's me really, just to say um, thank you for listening. And really, all of us need to put a lot of pressure on the RIBA to change those validation criteria. I think they are, are at the root of the problem for why we only have a third of our students coming out um, with you know, some idea about sustainable design. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fionn, that was great. Uh, really good to hear what's going on the other side of the pond as well. So we're, we're going to move quickly on to our final two speakers. Uh, who are both from C40 Cities, which is a network of the world's mega cities committed to addressing climate change. Uh, C40 supports cities to collaborate effectively, share knowledge and drive meaningful and sustainable action on climate change. So we've got um, two speakers. We've got Honorine Vandenbroek de Brennan, I hope I said that right, who is a benefits research manager at C40 and who is currently on her canal boat, I think. When we had a trial run yesterday, she was calling in from Rickmansworth and the boat was uh, flo floating up the canal. So who knows where she is now? And we've got Indriana, Indriani Leongo, who is calling in from Rotterdam. 
at C40, she is a workshop coordinator in their Climate Adaptation Academy. So really looking forward to hearing from these two. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Indriani first, I think, or Honorine. Um, it's um, Honorine. Yeah, well, it's, it's Honorine. Um, so hi everyone, I'm happy to meet you all. Thank you for your time. Uh, so I'm Honorine van den Broek working with Indriani at C40. Um, if you can go on the next line, uh, slide. And briefly about me, I'm both an architect and also an engineer. Uh, I'm also an ex explorer on my free time. Uh, as on this picture, you can see uh, that was taken on my last rowing journey across the Atlantic. Um, and through my practice and my explorations, I see how climate change impacts our environment. Um, and today we'll, but today we'll share our experience uh, working as an international charity leading projects and campaigns on climate change across countries, departments and ministries. And some of our stories and tips um, of, that we had uh, working out there. Uh, and just for the ones who are not familiar with us, we are an international charity. Um, who is connecting mayors of 96 mega cities in the world to ensure that cities reduce their carbon emissions by 2030. Uh, climate change issues and this in the most inclusive way as possible would have to do but we also um and through our cities we represent 700 million citizens but ourselves we are 250 mem uh, staff member who are working across those cities uh, and if you could go on next lab I, I just wanted to show a quick picture uh, that is a good image of what we can do uh, this was um, done uh, last it was a meeting we had last, last week uh, and those are 45 mayors of cities uh, who joined together to discuss about the COVID-19 crisis. And this is really our core role, is to provide a platform for the uh, to start with, uh, so within the cities and how we make those projects possible. And I'd like to sh start by a small story. If you could go on next slide. Uh, this is, um, it's a story about Chennai. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, great, thank you. So this is the street of Chennai uh, in South India, uh, who, which has approximately 7.5 million citizens. Um, and in Chennai, a quarter of the, GA, uh, the greenhouse, ha gas, greenhouse gas emissions of the city comes from transport. But climate change is not a priority for, most, for many citizens. What is their priority? Could you go on the next slide? 8,000 uh, people die each year from bad air quality in Chennai. 8,000 people. In India overall, it's one party. This is a major health issue. What is funny enough is that a third of air pollution is also coming from transport. So this is how we start getting people's attention. We draw the lines between climate, air quality and health. Um, so in 2019, we studied how we could actually improve this. Um, if you could go on the next slide. And we just found that buses represent nearly 20% of the, of the emissions coming from um, transport. So then we thought, well, Buses are actually something that are under the control of the city, so let's address this. Um, so we were curious to see what would be the impact of uh, addressing uh, the bus emissions, uh, both on climate, but also on health, because this was so important for citizens. Thanks. Um, and this is the, the impact it actually has on health. We did, the, we did some tools and we analyzed and we saw that the impact on health would actually be quite interesting. Uh, you see the, the premature death avoided each year of just just uh, by uh, replacing a part of the bus fleet by electric uh, buses. Um, and we thought it was quite interesting. So we went to the health department uh, with the transport team and we explained that. And the response we had was actually beyond our hopes. Not only the health secretariat uh, was getting more interested in the transport action, uh, where, whereas they were not really speaking together before, but they also wanted to get involved. And this is how they started discussing to unlock some funding from health 
to, to transport so that they could fund measures that would improve health in the future. Um, and, and if you could go on the next slide, this is actually the first buses that was inaugurated this year. And it's a really good story of how we, we made one department uh, of transport speak with the Department of Health just by trying to find what would be the main drivers. And this is not a unique story. There, there, there are many stories like this. You could talk about building retrofits and how this improved the user's saving, the user's health also through uh, in, de decreased dampness and mold, uh, or also the link between district heating and coal and air quality, as we mentioned earlier for Finland. Um, if you could go on next slide. So in all these cases, the projects had been unlocked and made possible when people starting drawing lines between health, economy and climate. Drawing the lines enable to show the direct win-wins uh, that they can, uh, that we can have, uh, on the face uh, to the benefits and the short-term benefits of climate action that can have long-term um, uh, impacts usually. So in order to reduce massively the emissions by 2030 and to tackle the social challenges, we must start to speak together. If you could go to the slide. Um, so this is why we run a program at C40 Cities that, re that does research to measure the impacts of, of climate action. Uh, so we develop tools that enable any city to, to evaluate urban projects and what will be their impact on social and economic uh, indicators. And those are a few tips that we got from our cities, uh, from our program. Uh, one of them is really to identify the key stakeholders and main drivers. This is really to identify what what will make their emotions and interest economic or uh, environment and find the strategy planning for the many so finding win-win project that will solve many many solutions uh, many issues at once uh, can we improve both air quality and GAG emissions can we improve people's savings at the same time as climate change so this is how it, it can work uh, and find for, with the stakeholders from the beginning asking the data share the project this will help you building bridges with all those departments, understanding their cultural background, their vocabulary, um, so that you can actually start um, making them follow your project and have some buy-in for a project. I'm an architect, but I had to learn how to speak to doctors, how to speak to health departments and communities. And this is uh, important because they want to see the benefits in the short term. And this is how we unlocked projects uh, at, a, at a bigger scale. So this uh, is a part of our work uh, and uh, our experience. And I'd like to now to give the uh, floor to my colleague, Indriani, who's going to be speaking. Hi, I'm Indriani, and I hope you can hear me well. So, um, I'm going to talk about five useful practicalities that my team and C40 in general use to work efficiently and effectively. First is the different time zones. Depending on your time difference, you may wake up to full inboxes or go to sleep with your email blowing up. This can cause you stress as you have to deal with many questions at one time. Even if people are in the same time zone due to Corona, a similar practice applies as everyone has different home situations and is on a different schedule. So my team organizes our inboxes to, to, by tagging related emails using different colors. Red means priorities, orange be aware, yellow is the least important that can be done once the red priorities are done. So for example, you know, if you want um, feedback on a project, you should send them out earlier. That is um, a red priority. Also take into account the time difference and note that this will delay your response time. Spend your time wisely to work on other pending tasks. Second is meeting logistics. Check out some tech that works for you and your team. And use the tools available to your advantage. For example, by using polls or breakout rooms at Zoom, which we just did. C40 uses several tools that help us to do our work effectively, regardless of time. 
um, you may want to match the tool with the type of announcement. So for example, chat on WhatsApp and meeting confirmation via email. Um, the other thing is that um, we integrate Zoom to a single click to arrange for a meeting on, um, on our Google Calendar. This is how C4 to do it, but if that is not possible for you, Drupal polls might be the most useful. Be flexible as well in your working time. C40 has an all staff call usually on Tuesday evening, London time, and many have to call in with a different time zone, usually at night or sometimes not on their working day. So what we do is that we compensate the day after or watch the recording later on. Um, so communication, um, I think this is very important. Um, agree on how to communicate and work to, together in your team. Consider how to engage new members and to let new members know what was agreed on communication beforehand to keep things running smoothly. C40 uses different channels on Slack for different purposes. Slack is one of the tools that we use regularly every day. And my team works primarily through email and Asana tool for more involved feedback and ping, we ping each other on Slack for quick questions and comments. We try to limit the amount of FaceTime required because of the time difference, but we are also adaptable enough to meet when it's urgent using WhatsApp. Um, do communicate when you're in doubt, really. Don't assume your work. Spend extra time to clarify your thoughts and ask questions rather than working on something that you're not, that you're not sure about. Also, make a list of points or, or questions that need to be answered during the call. Another important thing that I want to talk about is the cultural differences. This is a great book to read if you'd like to expand to other regions or if you have diverse team members. I highly recommend this book to both the professional and leisure readers. It has important lessons about global teamwork and international collaboration. The Cultural Map by Erin Mayer. So I'm gonna talk a bit of that. Based on Erin Mayer's book, there's a tool that allows you to compare how two or more cultures build trust, give negative feedback, or, or make decisions. So you have the low context on one side and the high context. The low context is that they, they expect more explanation when something is unclear. Communication is direct, Precise, dramatic, open, and based on true intentions. Well, the high contact is they expect to read between the lines, between the lines and understand the unsaid. The communication is indirect, therefore ambiguous, but also harmonious and understated. It's not what I said that matters, it's what I meant that matters. For, for example, I'm Indonesian living in the Netherlands, so so I have to be polite or, or be um, um, straightforward um, with the Dutch, talking with the, my Dutch colleagues. It's also the combination of, of high and low context. Um, last but not least, I wanna talk about interactions. So you may wanna turn on your webcam during your meetings, like for, for example, the breakout room sessions that we did. The power of small talk, five minutes small talk during, during all sessions, all calls, it could maybe useful for you. And um, on our Slack channel, there's a bot setting that randomly assigns us once a month to get to know other colleagues, which we've, we've never met or interacted before. So virtual lunch, virtual drinks, or even virtual exercises are, are great um, to interact between team members as well. Another last but not least thing is the catch up call every month with your colleagues as well. You, this is very useful. So thank you. Great, thank, thank you guys. You thanks so much. Um, okay, so uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, we're gonna attempt to do a question and answer session now. Uh, there's been two people working behind the scenes to kind of pull out all the questions that you've been asking. So thank you for putting them in the chat box and do carry on. I think um, Sam is maybe going to unmute all the speakers now at the same time. 
Um, but I'll start off with this um, very simple question from Mark Stevens. Uh, don't know where he is, but he asked, hey Scott, well done on what you're doing. How do I create a similar school in Ireland? Uh, I think kind of on that point, it's literally just a case of starting. There's no kind of, there's no mechanism. It's just students have to see it's there because if they don't see it in their uni, it's not going to be on their radar. And it's about making it as interesting and as engaging as possible. So trying to avoid mimicking certain things. Like I, when I first started the crisis studio, students very happily signed up for a tutorial because that's not intimidating. But if you offer something like a review or something quite formal, they kind of put it off. And that's just still a bit kind of terrifying. But I think it's just reach out to your kind of local community of architects, just raise a hand and say, I would like to do X, Y, and Z. Is anyone keen to teach? And I got inundated with people offering from up and down the UK to do stuff. So people are really keen to, t it's just a case of asking. And yeah, I think, I think that's there. a really good point about just being proactive. Um, it's definitely something that all ACAN members do very well. Um, I don't know if anybody else um, wanted to respond to that about setting up things where you are. Well, I guess I just wanted to chip in. There's been some chat about um, another subgroup in, in the UK. I think it's called um, either TIA or TSIA, I think, um, which is basically teachers. It's an offshoot of the AAE. Um, anyway, it's in the chat line, guys, if you scroll through. I think it's TSIA. Um, that is a nascent equivalent to the SBSE that I was talking about in, in the USA. Sorry, there's an awful lot of acronyms there. <laughs> but it's just to say there is a national organization apparently that is um, you know, focusing on, on uh, environmental issues in the UK. Very nascent. Great. Um, there was another question in the, uh, the chat about education and uh, seeing as you're up on screen, I thought I'd ask that. This, this came from Studio Bark. I don't know who it is at Studio Bark, could be any one of you, but it's a question for Fion uh, and I suppose for everyone else. Um, with education becoming more and more commercialised, how can we bring the climate emergency to the top of university agendas, where in many cases it seems profit is the only real driver? Oh, it's a great question and I actually sit on our university sustainability group and I can't tell you how frustrating it is. Um, it really is very difficult to make progress in, in the universities on, on getting a kind of zero carbon agenda going for all sorts of commercial reasons. I mean for me it's very much a bottom-up thing. It is, it's about tutors and students driving the agenda and I think that's what one of the reasons why Sheffield is such a great school of architecture. Um, is that actually we do things in spite of the university quite often um, where you know we develop our own protocols we follow the university rules as far as we need to but I, I think you know if we accept that we live in a neoliberal capitalist society um, you know we have to break that open by by taking our own power and I think Naomi Klein actually is, is a, a, a really great author I hope everyone's read her books on climate change versus capitalism. We used that in our School of Architecture in 2015 as the book to read for all the students and all the staff. And we spent a whole year um, mobilizing in terms of resilience. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I do think you can do it, um, but I think you have to take your own courage and kind of get together with colleagues. And as Scott has done, just get going. Yeah, so true. Um, maybe uh, Sophie could speak to that question as well, um, yeah, as uh, um, you also work in education. Yeah, I think Scott, you actually had, I was following it in the chat, you also had a nice response, I thought, which was great about then the use of buildings, you might want to follow up. Um, I think, um, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything that's said. I do think that now being in the Nordic region, um, it's we have a lot more freedom somehow. We don't have the ARB and REBA equivalent in the sense that uh, controls the educational content. So uh, it's directly the Ministry of Education, uh, both in Denmark and in Finland. And because they are now seeing sustainability at the core of everything, it's actually um, not, it's both bottom up from students and the, the practices that demand it, but it's also actually now from top down as well. So 
um, in Denmark, they've done amazing curriculum changes. Um, to, you know, everything is uh, sustainable architecture. On, uh, like a third of the school is a specific program and was um, part of that. And they've made amazing progress while I was there. And also in Finland, we're in a way um, more free to determine within the EU kind of Bologna Accord. So it's, it's, I do think it is something about the structure and how it's negotiated in the UK. Um, but I do think with that bottom up, we're not going to make a difference because, and this is why I think it's so great about ACAN and the Anthropocene uh, Architecture School, um, because I think that is what will make the difference. We have then, uh, um, you know, a momentum we can create basically among people, which I think has been missing so far when it's only top down. If students demand it, we do it. It's much easier. Yeah, that's so yeah. true. So and the energy that students have is, is really amazing. And Scott, That's you'll be it. aware of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know, Scott, do you, did you want to um, come in on that question at all? Uh, yeah, I think with students, they really need, they do need a bit of a kind of, a, to someone to show that they can jump. So they, they need a head above the parapet. When I was in architecture school, I was that one person doing the green stuff. And there was maybe of a hundred, I was the one person doing it. But then people in years below started to say, oh, because you did that in the exhibition, I started to do it. But then I found when talking to universities about the viability of getting this onto the agenda, it always comes back to money. But one alternative that I proposed to at an event, uh, Asala declares did. So I put forward that they've got all this work going on in their campus. So if your campus is a built learning resource. So realistically, you should be using your existing buildings for retrofit classes and POE because they exist are already there and you could be using any construction site on campus to be doing site visits and if you integrate that with the delivery of uh, CPD for practitioners you could essentially make it economically viable and when when I proposed this the university came back instantly and said oh no that's impossible we can't do it but it has been done in the past someone in the audience brought up that it has been done so it means that it actually improved the build quality of the buildings having regular site visits from students. So you just tie those two arguments together. You've got the economics, the education, it's kind of full triple bottom line. So that might be something to put pressure on. Yeah, um, I think we could probably bring in Indriani and um, Honorine on this point as well. I don't know if C40 do any work with um, educational institutions. I'm not sure about the other continents, but here in Rotterdam, um, we are trying to make uh, um, our way towards um, Erasmus University because I have a connection there and I also work part time there and they're asking C42 to speak about a lot of projects on, on climate change and how to help the students uh, realize that, oh, they will be the, the upcoming generation who will work on this. Yeah. and. Um... I've got another question here for, for you both from C40. This is from Darius, uh, don't know where he is. Uh, he's asking, what should be the common European and global kind of priorities for, for change as we have limited resources and time? Uh, seeing as you guys work internationally, uh, maybe you know what the priorities are. Ooh, that Everyone, um, we we at C40 tend to want it all. It means that we want to have clean buildings, clean, clean transport, and this within decarbonized grid, be necessary, and underpinning all the changes to have a very um, a, is a decarbonized grid, uh, because we can go towards clean building and in industries, but this is really underpinning all the changes. So going to uh, out of coal, out of fossil fuel is one of the main that you know, we're trying to. Uh, but what this trends at CPD is also being um, trying to adapt to local context because it really depends on its cities and may, some may have more focus on transport buildings or industries depending on its city. So we have more targeted approach depending on regions. Um, so this, this is quite a general approach. Basically, we really try to to, to emphasize either transport for Latin America, for example, or building retrofits for Europe. So we have specific programs linked to each region. I hope it answers, it answers a little bit. I would invite you to go to 
linked obviously to our website uh, where we describe a bit more in depth each declaration either on clean transport buildings or industry we have a declaration for each of our program and where we set specific targets for cities by 2030 and by 2050 for each of these topics great thank you and um, did any of the other speakers want to come in on that on uh, common global priorities for for change I'm going to just go to uh, Sophie, maybe, <laughs> pick you out. I was hoping you wouldn't, that's quite a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, uh, and actually, if I can just pick up perhaps on a question from Kat Scott, I just saw come through. I, I think um, some of the priorities in global change as well, and particularly in architecture, education, but also as practices, I think we also have to go away from focusing what's already uh, um, what is new and we have to start focusing on what's already existing and see that as an inquiry and an architectural inquiry that's important and um, uh, in itself and not just um, you know it's sort of when we talk about heritage suddenly that's an area of expertise that gains a lot of um, kudos in architecture but if it's just sort of standard retrofits and working with the existing then suddenly that's not really considered as a genuine architectural pursuit. And I think we have so many existing buildings um, that need to be kept, need to be done up. And I think globally we are actually a little bit too demolition trigger happy. Um, so for me, um, that would be a key thing I would like to see changed. And then particularly we have to teach it that way because we tend to focus mostly on new build. And new designs when actually it's if we are talking also yeah about climate change and the climate emergency we have to look at that and if i perhaps can say one other thing as well um related to i can't remember who asked it in the chat um but the uh the issue about embodied carbon and um energy use so if we have to reduce carbon emissions very quickly the question was i think related to how do we then change this uh, embodied carbon um and that it's more important than, than energy use. And I think we have to be very careful with this kind of debate because we have to do both at the same time. There's no two ways around this because otherwise we end up locking this in in the future again. And what I would say to the question of how do we do this is actually as architects, we still have a huge um, say in the building fabric and the specification of our materials and including insulation materials. So if we are more aware and more climate literate, as uh, Scott was saying earlier, we can actually really make that change almost immediately because a lot of products exist, aren't necessarily more expensive, but need to be carefully resourced and we can make that change going forward. Um, so for me, they're the, the big kind of global challenges. Um, yeah. I'm really glad you picked up on that question as well. Um, that was next to my list. So that was from Ranald uh, Boydell in Edinburgh. Uh, and the question was, um, if we need to reduce global carbon emissions over the next 10 years, then embodied carbon is much more important than emissions from energy use over whole life, especially as the grid becomes decarbonized. How can we best get rapid action on, on this? And I thought this was a good question to put to you because it kind of cuts to the bottom of um, this matter of urgency and um, how we need to do things very quickly. But um, it was great to hear from you on that, Sophie. I wonder if Scott, uh, as somebody that's kind of involved with Extinction Rebellion as well, um, who talk a lot about urgency, as we do, uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I think it's about your phraseology, because to talk about embodied carbon makes people think about a long life of a building. Whereas if you call it upfront carbon emissions, people will take it, they'll look at it differently. Because if we don't, if the Guardian this year changed all the language that journalists use when it comes to climate change. So if we as architects start pushing a change in how we talk about carbon emissions in buildings and not just focusing on operational embodied, but the upfront, how much carbon is that going to emit straight away? That's not something we can, like if it's embodied or we talk a life cycle, like a life cycle analysis, you're looking at 65 years. We don't have 65 years. We don't have 10. We don't have 10 years anymore. For every one year of an action, you lose two. So it's not about urgency. It's about immediacy. So it has to be upfront. That's changed the language. 
Could I jump in, Joe, just with a bit more on embodied yeah. energy versus um, energy in use? I mean, one of the big debates that's going on at the moment, particularly in the AECB community, is something called the carbon burp. And this is the problem that if we all go for very high, highly insulated um, buildings and we go for zero carbon, we could end up where we're actually using a hell of a lot of materials. So I think you know, one of the biggest challenges we've actually got is um, not to see embodied carbon and um, carbon in use as two separate activities. I think there's a huge danger of the architecture industry saying, okay, let's do our embodied carbon emissions now or upfront. Now let's go and do the in use and vice versa. They have to be looked at together and there is a sweet point. We actually have to find the sweet point where we project forward the savings made from the carbon in use against the expenditure on the um, upfront carbon and, and get a balance. And I think until we frame architecture in that way, I'm worried at the moment, for example, that we've got RICs running off with the embedded carbon documentation and then we've got the whole zero carbon in use and they're not, they're not joining up. Yeah, I? that's a really good point. Yeah, jump back in, Sophie. Yeah, and it actually comes back also with Studio Bark. I think that's Wilf's comment about this group of embodied carbon and operational carbon when they, as Fion also said, they have to go together. But also, we are not going to, we're really going to struggle to decarbonize the grid if we're also not reducing operational carbon as well, because we're just going to need gigantic. And then that also actually has knock on effects for embodied carbon of gigantic uh, renewable energy um, uh, kind of installation. So, um, and I, I would agree with uh, Studio Park and also what Theon said that I, I see I hear a lot in the debate, particularly in um, in the UK. I notice not so much uh, where we are that there is this sort of uh, pitting against each other. Now we have to look at embodied carbon. We've resolved uh, operational energy or operational carbon, and we haven't yet, or we also can't forget about that. And that is not one or the other. It's very much about both of these and that sweet point that Fionn talks about. Um, I think is is we can't um, uh, stress enough, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, I totally Maybe agree. Well. And the the recent changes to Part L that the government is um, Part L of the building regulations in the UK that the government is trying to uh, push through show that we need to still focus on um, uh, both. And that chat got um, loads of input from the chat box. People are just throwing in different different uh, terms for what we should call this upfront carbon yes emergency carbon well said scott it's all about emergency carbon holistic carbon as well another one um so i'm a bit conscious of time uh because we uh said that we were going to wrap up at 8 30 and it's much later where you are sophie so i think what we'll do uh is probably just wrap up there unless anybody had something final to say burning point <laughs> um in which case i will um uh yeah just uh, kind of wrap up i'm just going to share the screen again so um yeah thank you all so much for for coming um i hope you enjoyed it i hope it was uh, engaging and interesting it definitely was for me um if you want to get more involved then uh thematic groups are continuing to evolve campaigns and there were 11 campaign ideas that were proposed at the, the last open meeting that we held that was in an actual room. Uh, people are invited to get involved in these groups and we're going to share the links for each of these thematic groups on our um, WhatsApp ACAN uh, broadcast channel. So we'll uh, send you a link through Eventbrite to, to join that if you want. Uh, we're also going to send uh, a meeting feedback survey because this is the first time we've done this uh, please take a couple of minutes to complete the, the survey uh, what you thought there'll be nine very short questions in there and it will help us make um, future online meetings even better um, video link as well because we've recorded this we'll share the video link in uh, in that email and um, possibly put it out to our wider mailing list so make sure you're signed up uh, if not already and that's on architectscan.org forward slash home uh, the date of the next open meeting, which is going to be another one of these virtual affairs, is 6th of May. So get that in your calendars and we'll send out an invite soon. We don't know what the theme is, so 
email us, mail at architectcan.org if you've got any ideas for, uh, for another meeting. Um, normally at this point, we'd go to the pub, but uh, we thought we'd try, <laughs> I don't know whether we're gonna do this, we, we're gonna try breakout rooms, I think, uh, or are we gonna, oh no, we, we've set up another Zoom meeting called the Bishop's Arms. <laughs> And someone's going to share that in the chat now. Um, and hopefully then you can just join, join us in the Bishop's Arms for a drink after, after this one. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. And um, yeah, see you again next time. Thank you. If uh, if someone there's loads yeah, of chat in the chat everyone. right now. If someone could share the yeah. link again, that would be great. Yeah, uh, yeah and it would be very nice if we everyone uh, takes off their mute and we just give a big applause and a big thank you to the speakers and everyone who. Yeah, please. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.